Hey, thanks, thanks, Winnie. Let me see. I have to figure out these microphones. I'm a low-tech guy. I mean, I'm a rain rainforest guy, and they get all this stuff around. <laughs> this is also works, right? Yes. Oh, I feel so. My voice is so much more masculine with this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, indeed. I, uh, I just go around telling stories to people, and basically that's going to be a message here, the message of story. And uh, what is it? You're doing a book about ants. You know, I'm following the money trail, apparently. That's where people you know, they need to read books about ants. Certainly everyone in Google, probably an assignment for the week. Uh, but why did I do it? I grew up reading the adventure stories of the early naturalists, like Alfred Russell Wallace, Darwin, Spruce, all these explorers. And then, of course, the more recent people, like Jane Goodall, Schaller, and so forth. And they're, the recent ones that are always writing about pandas or elephants, and I thought, why not do adventures about the little people? <laughs> and in fact, one of the messages here uh, is that ants are much more like us than you might expect. In fact, uh, ants, well, let's put it this way, people, modern people are much more like ants than they are like chimpanzees. What chimpanzee society has to work about, worry about or deal with issues of traffic control, highway rules, uh, infrastructure, uh, public safety, environmental health issues, ants expend a lot of energy in these things, market economies, voting, ants do these things. Uh, these are the parallels that emerge as societies get larger and larger and only ants and humans have societies in the millions. So we're gonna go through some of these parallels, but the excuse for the book was to travel around the world and look for the most extreme ants possible. And uh, let's just start off talking about where we all began, down there in the dirt. And when people say, why are you studying ants? I, I tell them back, well, what happened with you? You were down there in your diapers like I was at six months, watching ants. You're the one that drifted. <laughs> and in fact, as children, we knew intuitively that ants are doing a lot of things that we can relate to. They are moving around in large groups, they're building roadways, they're, con they're getting food, they're catching things together, they're making homes. All these things connect with our own lives. And one of my messages is to get back to the point of view of a, of a child. This is one of the ways to success. And I do that in a couple ways. One is to be down there as I was as a child in, in my diapers, uh, you know, at the level of the ants with the acorns down there. And the other is to be up in the tops of trees. We all climb trees as kids. How many people here climb trees as kids? Excellent. I figured it was one of the rules of the game in Google. You gotta at least be able to climb a tree or at least a T-Rex and put something weird on it. So, uh, <laughs> This, incidentally, I'll, I'll speak to the photographs a little bit. Uh, this is a picture I took as a graduate student at Harvard Yard. I was figuring out how to take pictures, and I started off very quickly working with National Geographic. I was really lucky that way. And I was doing an article on acorns, life in an acorn, the things that moved into acorns is acorns are, are broken are breached by an acorn moth and an acorn weevil, and, and a whole community develops inside. And I had to show how the oak tree connected with the acorn. It's an elemental thing, but National Geographic needed that connection. People need to be reminded. So I uh, dug a hole for my head and stuck my camera in it and aimed up and photographed this tree in Harvard Yard. The police were called twice, and I eventually put a sign on my back saying, National Geographic photographer, leave me alone. <laughs> well, here I am up in the trees. And it's these differences in perspectives that make uh, a lot of things in biology interesting, and I think and that's a general rule across life. Uh, I kept climbing trees. I started climbing very tall trees. Eventually broke the Guinness Book World Records with a guy named Steve Sillett on a tree uh, and found all kinds of things in the tops of trees. That's not where we're going to go so much. Uh, today we're going to the small size of this thing. This is the, the, the baby look up at the ant picture. And you have to remember when you photograph ants, it's like photographing a baby. You don't photograph the top of the head shooting straight down. You have to get down with the baby. You have to get down with the ant, which means 
uh, as a National Geographic photographer, I am not paid unless I'm covered with mud. So this is a look at an ant that's uh, about standing about two millimeters tall, and it's uh, desperate to get at me. You can see its jaws and its posture. Any questions? I've been talking on and on and on. <laughs> yep. So you started off talking about lighting, how you wanted to do lighting. Yep. And lighting. There were bits and traces on some of those pictures of of light. So what's your field kit look like now for lighting ants? What's my field kit look like for photographing? You know, I used to, uh, for my main and fill light, I would I'd get these $15 flashes from something called Underground Photo. It's this cheap supply shop. And they would electrocute me all the time in the field. So I would literally get shocked every third or fourth picture. Now you can actually buy from Canon, Olympus, and Nikon little double flashes, which are much better than ring flashes and giving a three-dimensionality. That's the main and the fill light. You can get these little duo flashes or double flashes. And that's the essence of it. Put a little uh, a milky scotch tape over them so they're not quite as harsh. And you can add a little flash uh, from the back for that dramatic hair light look. <laughs> and uh, you got it. Yep. You saw a video of an ant death spiral. Can you talk about those a little bit? An ant what? Death spiral where they get circled on each other and just pile up. Oh, I think you're talking about, yes, the army ants. This is one of these, are, are you, where the ants follow each other in a big ring? Yeah, well, I didn't go into certain things about ants, but one of them is that they have no leaders, and so they all work on everybody transferring bits of information around, and this is usually a smart way of functioning, like a human brain, but sometimes it goes wrong, and if the ants in an army ant swarm get lost from the others, they will search around, but they never can leave each other. They're not independent. They're highly dependent on each other in army ants. So they, the, the best they can do is find uh, themselves again, if they've gotten completely lost, and they end up forming a ring when they find their tail end and just circling, and they simply do not know how to leave. It's like a, a brain breakdown, a psychosis or something. They cannot break out of that, and they eventually, after a week or so, they all die. Yes. Oh, um, OK. Well done, the ants are great people, but I have seen, like, for example, I was in Orlando, Seattle, for a while, written, that if a group of ants uh, is pushing a cheese or something, pushing, pushing something, like a, a piece of cheese or something, okay. so half of them will be pushing on one direction and half will be pushing on the other direction. They don't have much coordination in that. So, what have you observed? Well, that, I get into that a little bit. Some of the ants, he was looking at the wrong ants. He was looking at one of these species with smaller colonies. Once they get to bigger colonies, each of the ants carrying a piece of food, you're talking about how they work against each other. But in a large colony, they actually coordinate very well. Every ant around the perimeter carries appropriately so that an ant, a single ant can carry maybe 10 times its body weight. And the ants I studied, the marauder ants, was with the school bus. Uh, 100 ants can carry 10,000 times their body weight. So you do the math. They start getting really super efficient. And they carry it, they're not dragging it, they're carrying it off the ground. Is that bad? <laughs> wow, my computer's melted. Oh man, Google owns me now. Oh God. Oh, sorry. Sorry, a little breakdown. Yeah, so it all depends on the kind of ant. And there was a question over here. Um, maybe you were next. I'm kind of forgetting. Well, go ahead. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So what, what are your secrets in pursuing the depth of the field? The secrets of depth of field and focusing. Well, uh, actually, uh, one of my most exciting things as a graduate student is like I was gone for a while and I came back and there were all these like post-it notes all over my door from NASA because NASA kept trying to call call because they thought I had some great secret about depth of field and they wanted to and they were actually post-it notes asking for my body weight and whatnot and I'm going like all right and then I told them there was no secret that it's you just have to put the camera in the right place so I have no idea what it is that I have this capacity to do this but my human pictures are usually more out of focus than my ant pictures. So I really can't help you much. I guess it's back here. Is there leisure amongst ants? Is there a what? Leisure. Free time. Free time. Oh, well, this is, this is a good question. Free time among ants. It turns out most people think busy as a bee, that ants are working all the time. 
And in fact, uh, and that ants have no personalities. This bridges with this. And in fact, ants have a lot of individuality. There are lazy ants that do nothing. <laughs> there are ants that are highly motivated, that do most of the work and try to get the other ants to, to do it too. Uh, and so, uh, and there are ants that become specialized at various things, like playing the Stradivarius. There are ants that actually learn again and again how to get a certain kind of food and get better and better at it. So there's all this variation, and it includes laziness. So to answer your question. That kind of was my question. Were there slacker ants? What's the distribution of work? <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's do a survey. How many people here are slacker ants? <laughs> all right. <laughs> And how many people here earn over, okay, we won't, <laughs> correlations, okay, never mind. Yeah, anything else? <laughs> distribution of wealth. <laughs> distribution of wealth. I mean, there's something to get all the food and do none of the work, or there's something Well, then you're getting into slavery ants. Distribution of wealth, well, one of the interesting things I didn't talk about that bring, this brings to mind is a world headquarters for slavery is Lake Tahoe. How many people uh, have a place in Lake Tahoe? This is where uh, you have the highest density of polyergus ants, the slavery ants. They're on raids all the time. And these ants actually do something that's biologically, economically very obvious. That is, why breed all these specialists when you can just go get free help? And they raid other colonies. And unlike human slavery through history, these ants are even more dependent on their slaves. They're actually the ultimate slacker ants because once they get the slaves, they don't even know how to feed themselves. A slave maker ant will starve to death with a piece of cake right in front of it unless a slave picks it up and puts it in its <laughs> mouth. <laughs> Does it, that sound like Lake, Lake Tahoe to you? <laughs> Was there a question back here? Yeah, uh, some of the pictures look like uh, they were taken with a uh, microscope. Is that a fact or do you mostly use macro lenses? I just use macro lenses. My attitude towards the camera is like, a birder would be, you know, you have to have a telephoto, you have to have a microscope. In either case, all I do is I use the camera as a microscope, and all I do is press the button when something happens. To me, it isn't a camera, it's just that you press the button when something happens. I have gotten very good at pressing the button at the right time. And that's the way you should think about it if you want to try photography, is not get absorbed in the techniques, turn off the camera, and just think about the emotional moment and press the button. That's how my, uh, my attitude is. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Sure. So what's your reject rate? Then? My reject rate? It's pretty good for, for National Deer Advocate. There, was, there, were, there have been stories with like 10,000 rolls of film. And I've done stories with like 40 rolls of film, up to like uh, 150. I couldn't like, we're talking rolls just because they're convenient, and I don't remember how many images I'm taking nowadays. But I, I can't imagine taking as many as some people do because I would just go blind looking at them. I just figure you press the button when something happens. If nothing's happening and you're getting bored and you want to press the button a few times to impress your editor, that is between <laughs> you and them. <laughs> yep. Uh, I was a little late to remember this, but can you talk about, just because there are wide variation of these species of events, uh, what about the food though? Like how does, how does the animal food really well other than all the species? Well, I, I make a point, actually, in this lecture of not saying any of the things that are normally said about ants, like they have a queen, this yeah. is how they develop. I try to actually leave out everything that's obvious and go straight to the, what I think are the cool things. So we didn't actually talk about queens. I think I brought up her name twice. The queen doesn't give any commands, first of all. It is the worst thing to be in the colony because you're just stuck in a dark hole somewhere and you just lay eggs all day. So it's not like you're getting any oxygen, yeah. fresh air down there. So, you know, this whole notion of the queen is an unfortunate term because basically she is the mother of the ants. She's, they're all her offspring, but she actually has no particular role other than to lay eggs. And there's no variation of that between the different species? Not particularly. Things like this, just to, because I did leave it out, things like the Argentine ant that's invading California can make societies of hundreds of billions and trillions because the queens, instead of leaving the colony, stay with the colony and merge with its identity. They retain, became, become part of the same body instead of normally queens fly out, mate in midair, land, uh, dig a little hole, and they start a new community and that has a separate identity. They'll be killed even by their mother colony if they're found. It's like having a baby. It's a completely different identity. So uh, these 
super colonies are formed when all the queens manage to work together and form bigger and bigger and more massive communities until they've moved every, they're moving across every square centimeter of your yard. Okay, back there. Do ants have um, political organizations with leaders or do they have <laughs> sort of like a, a cast? And when you're in your role, you do your role. They uh, simply do what they do. They don't have leadership. There can be very temporary things. For instance, an ant that finds a particular piece of food for that moment will lead individuals to it, but it won't retain that role past the time where they've collected that food. Uh, all ants are created equal. You know, early humans had the same thing. There were, it was called a reverse caste system. There were no leaders. You could, there would be a charismatic person, but you would, uh, they would have no special powers. They could get vetoed out. Democracy has come sort of back to that a little bit. And ants have uh, really have that down to a T. And they have all this flow of information everywhere. It's much more like uh, you know, texting and cell phones overturning governments. It's more like things we're having emerge now than uh, what we think of as human societies. But certainly they don't have individuals that know much more than any other individuals or have much more to, to say. We have to wrap it up now. Any more questions? Am I signing books or something? Or is there there are books to be signed. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> so, okay, there's one desperate person with a question. Very quick. Um, is there a lot of genetic diversity in super-colony? I mean, could you see, like, the entire super-colony die out just due to the one that it is? Uh, well, that's a great question, and I think they're... What we have to do is crack their identity. I talked about the fact that they form these nationalities. We have to crack the way they identify each other, and there seems to be ways that, that we're beginning to learn that we can actually turn them against each other. That's the way to do it. Probably not a disease. There are too many of them. It will out-evolve any disease they get. Hey, thanks so much.